Here's Malcolm Gladwell with Alicia Keys. You wrote this book at the same time that you were doing your latest album. You know, I mean, I started to write the book before the latest album, for sure. But they definitely have synergies and they and I feel that they're companion pieces. They belong together. Was it strange to work on a book at the same time as music or it was the same process for you? Well, no, it's not the same process at all. It's totally foreign, completely brand new, um, much, much more in-depth, in-depth, you know, obviously the book writing process and the length of time that it takes. It was much longer and much more patience required to really follow through with everything and find the through lines and really be clear about the intention and the meaning and that it, that it, you know, that it makes sense the whole way through that it really brings you there. Um, but emotionally, I think it was similar in the sense of, mm-hmm. you know, just, I think with music, you also do have to find the truth in what you're trying to convey and you're just doing it in a much more concise way, which can also be harder because you don't have the length to deeply explain what you're truly trying to say. So in, 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 in those ways, they both have their challenges, but obviously music is more like a second skin for me than book writing. So in that way, it was totally different. But I think what was good about both recording the music and writing this book at similar times is that I was asking myself two similar questions. And and the question that I was asking myself and I was understanding more than ever before was this question about identity and who actually am I and who who of of who I am, who is who I've been told to be and who is who I'm actually. And that became a theme that was both, I was deeply able to search through the book writing process from looking, you know, from my very beginning stages to now. And then I was also able to search from this music, sonic, lyrical process. So I think it was, it was really cool for that because although it was the same question, it was two different expressions of the question. So that made it cool. You tell that story about how Swiss came to you and says, how, how come you never talk about being Italian? <laughs> which I love, which as someone who's biracial, I love that because we always have to pick a side, right? You know, I, I, I have to say that I've always been fortunate because I grew up in New York City, you know, heart of the city, right there, melting pot for real. There was never a moment that I wasn't seeing people of all kinds of descents and all kinds of beliefs and religions and places and styles and energies. And I think that really made a difference for me. Um, I didn't feel like I had to pick a side because I, I think I think if I grew up in a smaller town or I don't know, I think it was just circumstance and you know, just h- how my particular um, childhood was. I, I, I never felt like that. I definitely felt, I understood there were different sides, but mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I had to pick one, you know? And, yeah. but I also didn't realize, I think what, what his question, when he asked, when he said that, it was, I was very defensive. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, everybody knows that. And the more people that I started to encounter that actually didn't know that started to prove him right. And, um, and, and I guess, so in regards to picking sides, maybe we, I picked the side in, in, yeah. in a way I didn't yeah. think I was picking a side. I didn't feel like I needed to pick a side. I didn't realize I was picking a side, but I think in some ways perhaps I did. So that was what was yeah. really interesting about it. It, it just kind of, he put myself, he, he threw me in front of the mirror and I was like, oh, maybe. So it's so good about people who you, who love you and, and who you love, like, how they can provoke you to to think about things that you would never, there wouldn't have been a reason to think about. When he, when he asked you that, when he said that to you, was that the beginning of the process of the new album or were you already immersed in it when he, when he said that to you? I was already writing it. I think that it really gave it a perspective that I did not have prior. And I, I started to really think about, it turned, it, it gave me the, questioning of myself to not only think about race or to think about religion or to think about color, but to, but to go even deeper and think about emotions. Because for me, that's my biggest trouble, I find, or my biggest challenge or my biggest lesson or my biggest opportunity or whatever you want to call it, is, is I find that I, it's been very difficult for me to access my emotions. 
And so I've finally um, come to a place where I can acknowledge the myriad of emotions that make us all up who we are. And, you know, because the world is so structured and, you know, we kind of have been so taught to be in control of our, of everything, you know, that um, we don't, we're not encouraged to kind of see these darker or deeper or bluer or scarier or more vulnerable parts that are inside of us that are really a healthy part of why you are who you are. But if you don't know that side, how can you really know yourself? And so that's that. That's what it it, it started to send me down that rugged hole, and away yeah. I went. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to what it meant to grow up in the eighties and nineties in New York. Um, before I get there, I want to touch on this question of racial identity again, because you make that comment about your mom, that she's the blackest white woman you've ever known. <laughs> um, so it's almost as if like, so you have a white mother and a black father, but you, you have a kind of black white mother and a black father. Is that fair? <laughs> like, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. I mean, she totally is. I mean, if you, when you meet my mother or when you ever spend time with my mother, you can definitely, you know, she just, she has a certain spirit and she has a certain energy that, that definitely, you know, anybody would say she is one of the blackest white people that you have, you have ever met. <laughs> um, and she's definitely, you know, I think we've always had such a yeah. really diverse, interesting group of aunties and friends and, and, you know, um, her colleagues and friends and my friends and sis- and sister friends and all the people that you know, I've been able to attract and just have been a part of my life that have really created such a, like I said, a really robust, dynamic experience in regards to what people look like, what people believe, feel, dance like, eat, you know, live the whole thing. And so it definitely painted a colorful picture for me. And I really appreciate that. What would your mom say if, if your mom was on this call and I said to her, your daughter describes you as the blackest white woman. What would she say? I think she'd be like, yeah, I think she's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think she'd be cool with that. <laughs> so what's your, paint a picture of growing up with your mom in Manhattan Plaza. First of all, what, your mother is very, is really into music. The world yeah. you grew up with is intensely musical. What's she playing? You're, you're seven years old. What's your mom playing? Um, I mean, if I can remember correctly, she's playing uh, Bobby Caldwell. She's playing John Coltrane. She's playing Ella Fitzgerald. She's playing Marvin Gaye. She's playing Roberta Flack. She's playing Aretha Franklin. She's playing Nina Simone. She's playing, you know, all these really epic Stevie Wonder. She's playing all the greatest of the greats are coming through those speakers and those and those uh, those record players because that's what it was a record player and she had all the albums on all the shelves and it was just the soundtrack was so beautiful man yeah yeah and you say in the book that you from the age of four you knew you were you were going to be a singer i mean but at the age of four is when i fell in love i was bitten and smitten (laughs) i think that that's when i really fell in love with um, the possibility because uh, my 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 little sweet teacher at the time, Miss Hazel, who was kind of the, the the music teacher at at my kindergarten, she always so passionate and and so lively, and and she always wanted to expose us to different sounds and places and performances, and so our, our little selves were always going somewhere and singing some little song somewhere, um, mm-hmm. but she she also did these plays and those plays were the first opportunity that I had with kind of trying out to sing in front of people. And it was so scary. And I was so, so terrified, which, you know, it's so terrifying to sing in front of people, you know, much less in front of people you don't know is much easier, Mm -hmm. but um, in front of people, you know, it's super terrifying. And, but I tried and I sang, we were doing the Wizard of Oz and I sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow and I had to learn it and I had to learn all the words and I had to learn the melodies and sing it. And when I did, I felt something. And I, that was the moment that I just, I, I didn't feel scared. I, did, I felt good. And that was the moment that filled me up in that way and started that journey. So I, I didn't exactly know I was going to be a singer at that 
second, I don't think. But I did know that I felt something that I wanted to feel again. It found your world. Mm-hmm. At that mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. You, you, there's a couple of moments that I wish you'd done more of it, where you start talking about your relationship to, to, pia- to, to pianos and to, a, to the piano. If you're, can you talk about that? I thought that was so... Is there some... Can do you remember the first time as a child that you understood what a piano was and what it could do and, and what, what you felt at that moment? Well, I feel like pianos have always been around me. My grandmother on my mother's side always played piano. She was actually, you know, a singer and a writer herself. And then, you know, I think got married quite early to my grandfather, you know, call it right out of college, 19, 20, whatever that is. And then right away they started having children, ended up having nine children all together. And let me tell you, I have two and I'm trying to figure out how to get some space. So I don't know how she would have nine and like be able to do anything besides everything that was needed for that, you know? So I think at that point, you know, her dream was deferred. And, and so, but ever since a little girl going to visit my family there, there was always a piano there. There was also a piano at my other grandmother's house too. Uh, My father's mother, my Nana's house, she always had a piano. And I think her kids at one time took piano and didn't really stick with it, but it always was in the house. So there was always a piano fortunately somewhere. So I think from a very young age, I definitely knew exactly what it was. I knew what it was meant to do. And I was very attracted to it from a very early age. I would, you know, uh, in New York, I would pass by the Steinway shop and there'd be all those pianos in the window. And I was fascinated. I was, I was almost just drawn like a, like a magnetic force towards it. And I would stick my nose to the window and just look at it. I would want to play it. I would want to hear them. They look so beautiful. They're like art. And so I was very, very enamored with it. And 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 then, you know, but we never had a piano because that's like, first of all, our apartment was tiny and you can't fit something like that in, into our place. And and it wasn't even really a consideration or a thought um, until the opportunity arose that we actually were given a piano. And that was another thing that changed everything. So once I once once that happened and we actually had the opportunity for me to play one consistently, that's when I started asking if there was a way I could learn. And mm. and and it felt like in that way I I was just drawn to it. I can't explain it except anything like that. It wasn't someone wasn't always necessarily playing around me and said, "Hey, Alicia, jump on my lap and learn the." It wasn't necessarily that or I didn't have a big like church experience where a lot of people learn in, in church and kind of jump in and start to learn there. And that's how they play. That wasn't my experience either. But it's just so happened that the fascination and the love and the draw and the power was always there. And then when it finally revealed itself, it was like, again, that same feeling where it's like it found me. How old were you when your family got that piano? Um, I know I started playing and I started to take lessons at, a, at seven so I was right. I was right about that age. Yeah, and it was this beat up. Oh yeah, it was a you know a hand me down piano, which was the most uh-huh. beautiful thing I ever saw in my life. I couldn't have been more excited or more grateful. It was this kind of beat up brown wooden upright uh-huh. old player piano. So it had the doors in the front that would slide open. Where in the twenties or the thirties and whatever saloon it was in or wherever it came from playing paper would have been inside of it and it uh-huh. would have sat in the corner and played for all the people in there and they probably were dancing to it and a lot of times it probably wasn't played that often from uh, someone's fingers or maybe it was who knows um but it found its way to my living room and became the divider between my little part of the living room that was my little bedroom and the actual part that me and my mother used to sit in and watch tv and it was the wall and there it uh-huh. was Wait, please tell me you still have that piano. Believe it or not, I don't. I no! I, I didn't, you know, before anything started to take off or happen, uh-huh. I was able to get another piano. I'm trying to think of when this, I'm actually trying to think of when the cross happens. I, I think I got the, there's a piano that was a part of the first deal I had. And it yeah. was, a far superior piano than my little brown one. And I would, and at the time I didn't know what success was and I didn't know if I'd ever make it. And I had no idea. I was just like, Whoa, this is a 
beautiful piano. And I, and I, in my spirit and my mother, we said, well, who should we give the other piano to so that someone else can learn and someone else can have a beautiful experience. And so that was all we were thinking of. We weren't thinking like, oh, we better hold this because this would literally be like the most museum worthy piano ever. (laughs) We never, we never thought about it. Somewhere out there. Someone's got that piano. I think, and if they knew it was yours, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's worth a million dollars. When we come back, more from Alicia Keys. We're back with more from Alicia Keys. Tell me about Manhattan Plaza. I was, I, you know, I've been in New York for 20 years. I've walked by Manhattan Plaza a million times. I had no idea, first of all, no idea that that's where you grew up, but I had yeah. no idea that it was this kind of, world unto itself of all of these creative types from Broadway. And so just describe for us Manhattan Plaza for those who don't know New York. So Manhattan Plaza is like a once in a lifetime creation. Um, Basically, it was built to support artists and creatives in that area because it's on 42nd Street between 9th and 10th. And it's two twin towers. And um, one is on 10th Avenue, one is on 9th Avenue. And it was an experiment that the city did at a certain point to try to create an affordable living space for people who were creatives. Obviously, this New York City is all about creative people and that industry and the entertainment industry. And so what they did was they um, created a system that you would pay only a portion of what you made that month. So you know, as we know, artists have very fluctuating incomes. It's not always, uh, you know, you don't get a check every week. You know, you don't have a retirement plan. Um, it's very, very unstable. And sometimes you're working a lot. Sometimes you're working not at all. And so depending on whatever was happening for you that month, you would pay a portion of what you made. And I remember my mother told me that her 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 rent was about $75. So wow. that was, yeah. you know, at that beginning time. And, and, and so what they created was a really special place that also had, um, had like a playground for kids. So in between the buildings, there were these special things. And so in a lot of ways you could live in that building and kind of, ha- it was its own world unto itself. And everybody who was in that building knew each other and all the kids kind of played together. And, you know, there sometimes, you know, you'd, even not, even me discovering who lived in that building, I'm like, wow. <laughs> Terrence Howard, Larry David, Samuel L. <laughs> Jackson. You didn't see him back in the day. I don't recall seeing Sam Jackson, but you I You would have remembered been, if you had, right? I think I would, but I could have <laughs> been so young that, you know, it just doesn't dawn on you like that, you know? But I, I feel like I would have known if I if I saw him. But you know, he was he was yeah. also in that building, you know, for a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of crazy. It's like it's an only in New York kind of thing. There's, there's these places don't exist anywhere else. But seriously, seriously. But it's plunked in the middle of Times Square in the eighties and nineties, and Times Square in the eighties and nineties, you know, is not the world's most pleasant place. Were you aware of that fact that it was a sort of the world outside Manhattan Plaza was a little scary, or just did you just not did that not register to you when you were a kid? Oh, no, I knew very clearly. If you, yeah. you know, to go to school, in order to come back from school, in order to, you know, if there was any activity that I was doing, because my mother was big on that. You know, I'm a, uh, my mother's a single mother in a real mean city um, with a daughter. And so she was definitely focused on making sure that I had places to go and places to be. Because she knew if I didn't, then I would, I would find places to go and places to be. So um, every time I walked out on the street, even one of my earliest recollections early in the book, um, that I love a lot is the first time that I asked her, I, I asked her who were the women on the streets who in the winter barely had any clothes on. And she, you know, probably struggled trying to answer that question for a, whatever I was, six year old or whatever that was. So, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that energy of Hell's Kitchen, which literally was as it sounds. That name was perfect for how it looked and how it sounded and how it was. And and so I was very familiar with the life outside of that, which was full of a lot of a lot of pimps, a lot of prostitutes, 
a lot of X-rated stores and and theaters, um, a lot of heroin addicts, drug addicts. Um, it was definitely full of the New York scene. So, so I was very aware of what that was, and I think it actually informed my um, a lot of my character. Um, and you and I noticed as I reflect back that I've always been very, you know, mm, my exterior has always had to be well in place. And that is a lot because of, you know, those streets that I grew up on. Yeah. You sound like you, you had a pretty wild, am I right? I was reading between the lines in your book. I was like, how wild was Alicia when she was in, when she was a teenager? (laughs) What I wanted was your mom, I wanted you to, I wanted your mom to weigh in and say, Tell me the real story. What was going on when you were 15 years old? <laughs> I was definitely, um, I was definitely, I just knew I knew it all, like all 15 year olds do. I just, uh-huh. I knew I was grown too, because I, I had to be very uh, independent from a very, very young age. You know, my mother needed me to be able to get around the city. She needed me to be able to get to where I was going, get to school. If I had a piano class or a dance class, I needed to get there. I needed to get back home, you know. And and so I was definitely always on the streets and I was always able to kind of meet up with my friends or go where I wanted to go. In essence, she was definitely on me for sure. And she was wild. So you did not want to upset that woman. To this day, you don't want to upset that woman. It's really just so much more than is necessary that you just like, let's just, <laughs> let's just get it right, please. So she and she, I, you know. Hey, I'm not even mad at her. She had yeah. to be. She had to be. And I and I know when I have to go in on my kids like that too, because they have to understand how serious it is that they would never know in their young mind what I know. I understand why she had to. You know, I do. She had to make a point and, and I had to listen. And she didn't have a dad to send down and say, Alicia, put the bass voice on. It wasn't like that. You know what I mean? So I I I understand, but but she so I was definitely. I just, I think I was, I was very smart. I really, I knew how to navigate. Um, I also had a lot of older friends. So I felt a lot older than I was. I acted a lot older than I was. I was probably pretty fast in regards to my experiences and things like that. So I just, I had a sense of stuff that most people my age never did. And I just, I couldn't go back. Like I I didn't know how to go back. I was already, I was already so grown and responsible. And, and kind of crazy and loud mouth and, you know, thought I was extra tough and all the stuff that you think as a kid. <laughs> I, you know, it's irrelevant, though, because you had your whole timeline as an artist is sped up. So you, what happened to you at 19 is what usually happens to singers at 25. Mm. People, I think, forget that if you grow up in New York, particularly as you grew up in New York, you're just you're two, three years ahead of everybody else. You just have to grow up so much faster. So everything yeah. happens to you way earlier. That is true. I mean, so I signed at 16, graduated high school at 16, went to college at 16, and also started my, you know, the experience, the journey of trying to become an artist at 16. Yeah. And yeah. so all of it just was like, boom, <clears throat> here you go. Yeah. Tell me, it. wait, so I want to know your 16-year-old self, it's Friday night, where are you going? Because I, I asked this question because I was in New York. That's the year. It's right when I came to New York. Well, me and my friends were either trying to sneak into the tunnel. There was a club uh-huh. called the Tunnel. Oh, I that remember Fantastic Tunnel. Flex always played at. So we were always trying to sneak in the tunnel, try to see if we could like dress up enough that people wouldn't know that we're 16 trying to sneak in. Like I said, we, we all were wrong a lot of times. Uh-huh. Um, we did that. We went a lot to the skate key. There was a there was like a skating rink in the Bronx called the Skate Key, and even me and my friends never skated because we were always like, if we need to run up out of here, I don't want to be on a pair of skates. So we never skated just in case we need to get out of there, and we never took off our jacket. And I never took off my jacket in places for years. For years, I never. T- People would ask me, "Can I take your jacket?" No, keep my jacket with me. When you need to get out, you need to have yeah. your jacket. So that was like always just instinctual for sure. Um, <laughs> and then we go to we go to each other's house. We would we would hang out like um, you know we would hang out in Harlem a lot, which is basically just a lot of walking around. You basically were you went nowhere. You just walked and walked. 
different guys would try to talk to you and you would just do the game and keep walking and walk. So we had a lot of like random walking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little bit of what we did. And what are you, what are you at that age, you're listening to what? So it's because the music scene, particularly the hip hop scene in New York is exploding right now. Oh, it's the best. It was so good. I mean, it was Mary J. Blige. We were listening to Wu-Tang Clan. We were listening to Nas. We were listening and listening to Biggie Smalls. We were listening to Tupac. We were listening to um, uh, Black Moon. Black Moon was popping at the time. They were amazing. We were yeah. listening to Smith and Wesson. They were crazy. They were part of that whole family. Um, we were listening to, you know, like SWV was was in the consciousness at the time. Like Jade and Blackstone were in the consciousness. Like big girl groups with big voices, a lot of in vogue. Um, we were listening to, uh, man, there was so much great music. You know, there was so mm. much good stuff that was just so, so many different sides. We were listening to like Shabba Ranks and, you know, different, different, Mad Cobra, I remember. And there was all type of different reggae artists, Buju Bantan. And um, there was just a, a, a bunch of different styles of music that was happening and we were listening to all of it. Yeah. And you're, when do you start, you see, you're in a girl band, which I did not know. That was one of my favorite ones. <laughs> and what do they call it? Ambition? What, how, Ambition. Long, <laughs> how long were you in the band? A while. I mean, we really believed in that. We really wanted to uh, take it all the way. We had our rehearsals all the time at the PL, PAL on yeah. like 124th street. Um, we were, I, I mean, it was a couple of years, I think, that we were just meeting up and trying to make it work and practicing and after school and working on what our kind of mu- What kind of music? I, that's what I, what, what I couldn't get a sense of. Was that, band, when, at that age, are you making something similar to the kind of music you make today? Or was it? Yeah, it was mostly like we would sing our favorite songs. We were working on arrangements yeah. to the songs that we loved so that if we ever had the opportunity to sing for anybody, we would be ready to kind of perform. Yeah. Wait, but didn't you write it? You, I, I made a note of it. <clears throat> uh, didn't you write what, a song called I'm All Done? Was that, you mentioned that in your book. I'm All Alone is the first song I'm that I ever alone. wrote. And that actually was triggered by the death of my grandfather. Yeah. And that happened at about um, 12. I think I was about 12 at that time. And, oh, and that was, cool. that wasn't really in the group at that time. I mean, there was yeah. other like little groups that I was dibble dabbling in at that time. But, um, but when I wrote that song, the significance of that was just, it was the first time like, an experience was painful enough mm-hmm. to really, you know, provoke me to take all this information that I had with piano and with music and, you know, sit down and create a thing. And it was the very first time I did that. Mm -hmm. And did you continue to write all the way from that point forward? Were you continuing to write music all the time? Or is it something that you left for a while and came back to? Like, is this... I think once I started, I really, I I recognized that it was something I could do. And I also recognized that it felt really good to just sit down and say what you feel. And I remember one of the, one of the, one of my dearest sisters, um, was all, who was also in the group with me, she and I, she started to play the bass and I played piano and she and I would get together a lot and just kind of jam and write. And you know, my mother wasn't home when she was at work late, mostly all the time. And so she would, my friend would come to my house and have her bass and I'd be on piano and we were listening to a ton of, uh, uh, Marvin Gaye was going on album and, and the song that we listen so much to is Flying High in a Friendly Sky, which to me is one of the most unbelievable compositions ever. Because you hear this bass and it constantly walks up and it's like this relentless jazzy uh you know stupor that he's describing how he's feeling being high. And it's so it's so painful and beautiful at the same time. And, um, and that was something that we were really fascinated with. And because she was starting to learn the bass, we would play like these type of energies and songs. And, and I think that was really good for both of us to just be holed up inside, you know, playing music, which is why, you know, music saves so many people's lives. What's the first song you wrote that you think is your first truly great mature song? <laughs> 
like a song you're you would happily play today at a concert? The very first song, I, the song I consider my first good song, is 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 a song called Butterflies, and that one I wrote when I was fourteen, and I would play it today. I'd play it right now. Um, it's really sweet but beautiful, and surprisingly, yeah. surprisingly mature for fourteen yeah. in a way yeah. that it's. It, it, it kind of seems timeless. It doesn't feel like, oh, yeah, you can tell I was super young when I wrote that. You can, as you can see how my songs developed over time and became more intricate. But but you don't pay attention to that. It just feels like a, a, a sweet song. You know you know what I'm going to ask you right now, don't you? Oh, gosh. Well, because I don't have a piano. <laughs> no, you can't, you just, can't you just like sing like two lines of it, three lines of it, a cappella? Sure, I can. You know, it might be the scratchier version, but that's all right. Um, let's see. So verses. Lately, when I look into your eyes, I realize you're the only one I need in my life. Baby, I just don't know how to describe how lovely you make me feel inside. You give me butterflies, got me flying so high in the sky. I can't control the butterflies. You give me butterflies. Got me flying so high in the sky. I can't control the butterflies. <laughs> oh, God. You wrote that when you were 14? Yeah. That is like... I was also listening to a lot of Anita Baker. I remember that, yeah. too. My mother yeah. was listening to a tons of Anita Baker. And so back to that Ella Fitzgerald, Nina ba- Anita Baker, um, there was this kind of jazzy undertone that I really uh, related to a lot from those artists that she played when I was growing up. Yeah. When you sang that right now, did that take you back to 14? I was kind of remembering myself on my little piano that I told you about the brown one with the ear doors sitting there and me just kind of, I remember also listening to a lot of Brian McKnight at the time because he was a, he was a, you know, such a beautiful piano player and songwriter and, I was just fascinated with listening and how that was. And he would do these really pretty piano songs. Um, and so I think I was uh, taking some of that energy and just sitting at the piano and finding these chords and feeling the flow. And I was just alone. And I wrote that. Yeah. And your, see, your mom comes home from work and you turn to her and you say, I've written this song and you play for, you play for her on the piano. What is it? It must have blown. Is her mind blown? Like, what's your mom's reaction to this prodigy inside this tiny apartment in Manhattan Plaza? I don't know. I, you would definitely need to ask her. I, I should I just have interviewed her. I know. I'm I'm just like, what does she think? <laughs> Why don't you call her and talk to me later? But the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, you know, I don't remember her. I'm sure that she was excited and you know when I hear Egypt Egypt will jump on the piano he plays piano and and he'll come up with these songs and I and I can hear inside of the song what's go, what's going on in his mind and what he's stumbling on and it's good and I can say man he doesn't know it yet and he doesn't it's not thinking about it all extra hard like that but I I say you know that kid has an ear like he has something yeah. that he and stuff and and i'm always like wow i'm sh- I'm, I'm interested i'm not pushing it or extra yeah. trying to make them feel uncomfortable but I'm, I'm i'm always interested i don't know if she had the time to even get into it like that or did i play it for her right away or was i working on it for some days did she just overhear me and just let me have my space i don't recall her being like Oh my gosh, wow. That's like, I don't remember her being all like that. Yeah. She's always been enthusiastic and everything. So I'm not saying she didn't, but I, I don't recall it being kind of a thing. So yeah. I'm not sure what she was thinking or feeling at that time, because that was like 14. When a little later, maybe at 16, when I started doing showcases and I started to maybe, you know, it seemed more like a something that maybe she had to even be nervous for me about or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, um, I'm interested in myself. Let's both call her. Shoot, we should have just added her in. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Let's 
But this happened. I, the reason I asked that question is that one of the fascinating things about the book is when you talk about at a very young age, you meet these very, very powerful people who hear you and instantly see that there's something special there. In mm. fact, you know, I'm thinking about Clive Davis. Actually, tell the Clive, and then, and then Prince and Oprah, but we'll, I want to talk about those three. I mean, first of all, it's, my mind is still blown at the age of, how old were you? 19. When the music came out or when we were first still working on it? Because that was probably when, like 17. No, that, oh, yeah. How old? Do, no, the age at which three of the most important cultural figures in the world of music and beyond music recognize something in you. Right. That's really- um, let's see. Well, first, you know, I would say that it first started with my first manager, Jeff Robinson, who was the first one that even before me, you know, saw that there was something in me that was special and unique. And that was about that, you know, 14, 15 mm-hmm. age where I was still with that first group. And he was the one that, you know, said, you really support, you really should be a solo artist, of which I was like, no way. I don't ever want to be, who wants to be a solo artist? Sounds so boring and lonely, but, um, you know, he was right. You know, he was, he was right. I, he saw that I played already, he saw that I wrote, he saw that I could do them both together. And, and it just created something that was, that was special that he saw. And so he was the one that, you know, took me around to the different labels and created the opportunity for me to meet these different people that I met Peter Edge, who also became a really big part of my life. And to this day is, you know, the president. Uh, uh, and so he, so he definitely introduced me to Peter and then, um, Peter, then, then Jeff also brought me to Columbia. And that was the first time that I had my first situation, which didn't work out that well. And then, and then between himself and Peter got me my first meeting with Clive Davis. And that was about, mm, I'm going to say that was about 16 or 17, because I spent a couple of years with Columbia uh, creating Mm -hmm. most of what became songs in A minor. But they um, they just didn't understand the vision. They didn't get it, and and there was a lot of internal changes and stuff like that, which happened all the time in business. And so so um, so that so I met Clive at seventeen ish, and then I worked another uh, couple of years, you do, know, finishing up the music. Do you remember what you played for him? So you go in just to, for those who don't know, Clive Davis is like the most legendary figure, the greatest talent spot. I mean, he's the, he's a god in the music world. You walk into his office at, a, at, a, at Arista at, and you're 17. Were you, were you intimidated? I was late and I was so annoyed that I was late. And Jeff was so mad at me that I was late. He's like, this is, this is like the biggest meeting of your entire life and you're late. And I felt bad. I didn't want to be late. Like no one wants to be late. No one's really. So, so, so that was shitty. And and fortunately, you know, it was on my side that I think he had his meeting ran over. So something happened that I didn't seem late, even though I was yeah. late. And, and 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 then of course I'm nervous because I'm like, you know, this this is I at the time I was trying to get out of my previous label deal, which wasn't going well. And he was interested and he heard already a group of songs because I created so much of what, what became songs in A minor. And I was playing stuff like I had a song called Why Do I Feel So Sad? I know that I played that. Um, I had a song called Loving You, which was greatly inspired by Aretha Franklin, like that style of a song. Uh, I had my Butterfly song that I was playing mm-hmm. for sure. And then I was also playing some Brian McKnight covers and some Marvin Gaye covers and stuff like that. I think that's probably that was my repertoire at the time. How long and did I- you play for? I mean, you know, like a little, probably like a 20 minute or 15, yeah. 20, you know, a couple of songs, a couple of talking, a little, you know, that type and are you, of thing. Are you looking at him while you're playing? I don't, I mean, I was definitely nervous. I hadn't, yeah. you know, I hadn't, I had done a lot of showcases because in order to get that first deal, we did a lot of showcases and, and I had been performing a lot since that first group. And I had a sense of like how to put my thing on, but I was always... I was always quite nervous. Was I looking at him? Probably a little, but not a lot. Like not extra overconfident, just like enough to do yeah. my thing. And he didn't, he didn't have any doubt in his mind when he, when he said, I want, he, he said, I want to work with you. you there it wasn't any hesitation. I don't know if that happened exactly on that spot or if it was a call that 
maybe transpired later or a second meeting even. But mm-hmm. I'm, but as I recall it, he definitely, I mean, he said he complimented me in ways that I had never been complimented. And to your point about the the people that he's worked with, you know, you know, like the, you know, like the Santanas and the Earth, Wind and Fires and, and, and just some of the absolute Joni Mitchells and like some of the absolute all time greatest artists of ever. He's been a part of, you know, their creative trajectory. And so he would tell me that he thought I was a lot like a Joni Mitchell and, you know, he never stepped foot in the studio with her that she could create all her things and write all her songs. And she just came back to him and said, okay, my music is done. And she, he was like, I see that. I see you like that. And I couldn't believe it. You know, imagine my 17 year old self being told that he saw me like someone like a Joni Mitchell. I was like, what? <laughs> so um, high praise. Yes, he was very excited. He knew what he saw. He knew what he has, had his eyes on. And he also knew that there was like one in a billion chance that Columbia would ever let me go. He was very clear about that too. And they did, to their everlasting dismay, I'm sure. (laughs) To my everlasting great fortune. (laughs) When we come back, Alicia talks about the beginning of her friendship with Prince. We're back with Alicia Keys, who had to run to another interview, but Malcolm requested she tell her Prince story first. Wait, you got to tell your Prince story, which was... Another one of my favorite parts of the book. That story is so bananas. So you, you want to do, you want to cover a Prince song on, on A minor. And right. so, and it's up to you to call Prince to ask. That's the. I mean, other people could call, but it would likely not go well. And uh-huh. I think that they understood that if I called, maybe it made it a little harder for him to say no. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I was, he was definitely observing what I was doing and he, um, and he was, you know, he was so voraciously a, a music lover and uh-huh. I'm really excited about new music all the time. I never met anybody like that who just knew the pulse of new music so, so well. Um, and so that, that was him. So he was definitely observing what I was doing. And so, but pause on this. This is really interesting. So at this point, you haven't put out any any records ever. The Prince are out, knows who you. I put out "Fallen" by then. Oh right, oh right, right. Okay. And so he was, yeah. he would have heard "Fallen." Yeah. And and then it was up to me to say, oh, as a part of the whole album, I also recorded uh, "How Come You Don't Call Me," and would it be okay for you to clear that to go on my album because he he's the songwriter and you do have to clear covers um, with yeah. the song. So that was that was me asking him that question. And it was so crazy because, like, first of all, I hadn't spoken to people that I adored like him ever before that phone call. Like, I didn't just call it. That was not a normal occurrence, if you can imagine. Even today, you know, I miss him so much. And even today, if he was still alive and I was calling him, I would still feel nervous about calling him. So just yeah. understand, like, that that part probably would just stay put. But if you can imagine that it's the very first time I'm ever calling somebody who I admire on a level that's like unexplainable and calling to see if maybe he'd be cool with me performing his song after I've heard time and time again that he turns everything down. So that was what I was up against. I was about 18, I think at the time, maybe 19. And um, I'm in some hotel room because we were doing some little tour through these different hotels and um, for like press and stuff. And I'm in my hotel room and I'm calling on the phone and the person says, hello, are you looking for Prince? And I'm like, is this Prince? And they're like, no, hold on. And they transfer me. And I'm like, okay. So then the next person picks up, hello. I'm like, hello. It's not him either. Hey, are you looking for Prince? And I'm like, yes, I'm looking for, okay, hold on. And they transfer me again. I'm like, how many times did they get? They transferred me at least four times. And so every time the call was transferred, my nerves got more yeah. and more terrified and scary. He finally got on the phone. I hear his voice like it's him. It's his voice. I don't even know what to barely say anymore. I had some script written down. But, you know, I start talking to him and he was super friendly and, and really encouraging and saying he heard what I've been working on and he knows that I'm writing and producing my stuff and he really loves that and to keep that up and 
And that's when he invited me to Paisley Park. So I, I told him, I asked him if I could put it on the album. And he said, why don't you come to Paisley Park and play it for me? I was like, okay. <laughs> it's like an audition. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so that was, that was nuts. I mean, one of the craziest phone calls of my life. And you go, how long afterwards, how long did it take you to go to Paisley Park to play it for wasn't that long after because we were still trying to get it cleared and he kind of made it seem like if I came and played, maybe he'd be more inclined. So I'm pretty sure yeah. we went quite quickly. And he has a whole audience of like hardcore Prince lovers in the, in, in an auditorium. The yes. Yeah. It, first of all, it's freezing. I mean, wow. It's so cold out there. It's winter. Um, I have my, this little tiny leather jacket that I was wearing everywhere. I don't know what was the matter with me. Why did I not have another jacket? And, um, and it was super freezing over there, but it was incredible. It was a world all its own. It was all his memorabilia and incredible moments that he's been a part of and contributed to culture, to musical culture. It was just embodied all right there. And the doves and the purple and the pianos with writing on it and the outfits from Purple Rain. And I mean, it was literally stunning. It was the most beautiful place I ever saw. And then, you know, for him to have this kind of performance space where the diehards could come and just like be a part yeah. of his girl. It was nuts. And he becomes a friend afterwards. Definitely. He definitely became a mentor and a friend who checked in on me and would often come to my shows. He would often talk to me about the hard things, you know, as a performer, uh, as a as a gr- an artist who's whose music is starting to reach new places and new people and what that was and on the, on the business side and ownership and being in control of what we create. And also just, you know, even like sonically how it sounded at the shows. And he was very, very specific. Uh, He didn't just come to like chill. He never came to just chill. He, He always came with an intention and a purpose and something to teach me. And so even though every time I spoke to him, I was just terrified and I was trying not to like cry because he told me my sound, you know, just didn't translate well in that show. And I'd be like, oh no, does that mean it sounded bad? He wasn't trying to tell me it sounded bad. He wanted me to be aware that yeah. that part needed to improve, you know? And yeah. and, and so that, in that way, he was like a big brother who would really tell you, you know, what, what's happening in, in a true way. Um, one, one last thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, you just performed at Kobe's memorial service. And the Grammys and Obama's inauguration. And I was thinking, you're in this really interesting position that very few artists are in, where you're you're like a you're the kind of person we turn to. Um, and I was thinking, who else has been that played that role in American music? And I would say, you know, maybe 20 years ago it would be Paul Simon. Remember after 9-11, he played the boxer and he played. That was the person whose music we turned to when we needed some kind of... And in Jordan Civil Rights, it would have been Harry Balafonte, probably. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's, that's, so that's the kind of... I was thinking, you're in that tradition now. You're like the... I just wonder what that feels like. Are you aware? I mean, there's a kind of responsibility that comes with that. And a kind of... Are you, are you A, aware of that? And what is it, how does it make you feel? I definitely... Um... I definitely know that as I've grown and as I've become more comfortable in my skin and more truly who I am, that I know that there is a deep connection that we share and that we have. And I know we've always had it, but I don't think I was ready before to truly be comfortable with it, to be um, to be completely just mo- so much more open and so much more able to share my truth and what I'm learning, what I'm experiencing, and, and even my vulnerabilities and my pains and my fears, my sadnesses, um, the humanness that lives in all of us that I for so long felt like I had to put into a steel box so that I could get on with each day and just get through all the demands and things like that. And so now that I'm so much more clear about the fact that part of the beauty of us 
is all those sides that we spoke about at the beginning of this conversation, the, the scary, the vulnerable, the fear, the anger, all the parts that we kind of box up and put away because they're too out of control or they're, they're too personal or they, they feel too raw. I've become so much more comfortable with expressing. And, I, and since, I've, since I have, and since I have started to know myself more and be comfortable with all those parts of myself, I find that the connection has deepened in a way that I never expected. And I definitely wasn't ready for before because I wasn't even ready to do that with my own self. So now that that is happening, I do see how the connection is. To your point of what you're saying, there is something there that's creating, it's creating a, a level of deeper understanding, a level of solace, a level of um, connection that creates something which just has been circumstantial because we're in a really tumultuous time and we need each other just more than ever. And so I always wanted to be purposeful. I always wanted to do things that had meaning to them and not just empty reasons. And I have been getting these beautiful opportunities that even I have not known were meant to become what they did. I just was okay showing up and comfortable enough to show up and even through to all the scary things that I personally feel, you know, all the time when I'm going to perform mm-hmm. or when I'm going to, you know, put something on my back and walk out with it and hope that it all goes well, you know. Um, so I think the openness that I am experiencing is creating that kind of connection between us. And I am i don't know when it exactly started, but mm-hmm. I'm really loving it. And I'm looking forward to more. There's something beautiful about the fact that like a, a biracial girl from Manhattan Plaza speaks for all of us. Yeah. You know? Like that's mm. kind of that's kind of amazing. Wow. I, I'm <laughs> loving it. More to come. More yeah. to come. Um, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. And best thank of luck with you. Too. Uh, yeah. All yeah. right. Have a good one yeah. and be safe and be careful and be good. And, yeah. and hopefully we'll can sit down and have a meal. And talk yeah, when things get day. normal. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Bye bye. Okay. Alicia Key's book, More Myself, A Journey, is out now. And a new album, Alicia, comes out May 15th. You can stream some of the artists and songs she mentioned in her conversation with Malcolm at brokenrecordpodcast.com. Broken Record is produced with help from Jason Gambrell, Mila Bell, Leah Rose, Matt Laboza, and Martin Gonzalez for Pushkin Industries. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. Thanks for listening.